so um, this is a small landscape study um, and I'll be using Mesolithic and Neolithic archaeology. Um, it's the area that I'm looking at is the Colne Valley in West Middlesex. So I don't know which side to look at. Um, so you can see <laughs> this is where it is in uh, the context of the rest of the UK, small little area here. And this is kind of a zoomed in version of the Colne Valley kind of boundary that I've used for my study. Um, so it's, an, it's a project using archive data and most of it initially comes from the local historic environment records. Um, this is, actually I don't know if it's a good idea. Oh, um, so this slide here is showing um, unsorted data, uh, Mesolithic and Neolithic finds and features. Um, for the Greater London Borough of Hillingdon. Um, this is the Stanwell Curse here, and, and these are mostly uh, small finds scattered. <coughs> so that's the Hillingdon data set that I've got at the moment, at this stage in my study. But I also, um, and this is the first set of analysis that I've done. I do also have data for the other boroughs and counties around the area as well. So um, this boundary for the Cold Valley is, uh, so I'm kind of roughly following the Cold Valley Park, but it's also an arbitrary boundary um, because I wanted to include a variable topography and geology. I wanted to include paleoenvironmental data and sedimentary detail for the area. Um, because I want to look at people's movements and um, different movements. I want to look at the movement of people through this landscape over time. And I want to look from the floodplain to the terraces along the coal tributaries, um, and some of which, some of these are only visible now as paleo channels. So this study area is approximately 17 miles north to south, and it's approximately seven and a half miles um, east to west at its widest point. So that's the um, geography and the data sources. And the approach that I'm taking um, is, is a micro-historical approach. So in essence, this is an intensive study of a small unit of research within the broader context. And specifically for my study, this is small dispersed material signatures within the broader context of site-based uh, concentrations, excavations. Um, Microhistories were uh, developed initially by prehistorians as a way to challenge the absolute in our narratives um, by bringing in smaller, less visible stories. So for me, in terms of artefactual material, my data sets are going to include a lot of small uh, spot finds and small scatters. So, for example, I've got a nice piece up here from the Hillingdon data set. But also, we're talking about broader context. So I'll be looking at these um, as well as more visible signatures. So visible signatures we get from where people have collected together um, concentrations of material as scatters or subsurface deposits or structural features. Um, so including pits, post holes, stake holes, gullies, etc. Um, and in the Neolithic, in my study area, I've got uh, uh, the Stanwell Cursus, for example, which is this slide here. Um, and this is a causeway enclosure at Riding Court Farm near Windsor. And I've got other features like the Neolithic house at Halton in Berkshire. Uh, but as I say, I'm also referencing these uh, spot finds, small scatters, features against the paleo topography of the area, the geology of the area, the paleo environmental detail and the sedimentary detail. And um, I want to look at how movements between places at different scales 
connect at different paces across the material. So for example, in the Mesolithic, uh, this is some concentrations of faunal and lithic material at, uh, at Three Ways Wharf, which was interpreted as a butchery site. Um, it's got a dense site signature for the early Mesolithic, um, for a, an early Mesolithic occupation, where a group of about 20 people left behind enough material that we know that they set up here for an extended period of time. So they left behind a scatter of animal bone, um, and that not only tells us about the meat that they hunted, but also about the landscape and the type of woodland that they were inhabiting. Some of these long bones had butchery cut marks and some pieces were burnt at the ends, probably to make it easier to get marrow out of them. So again, this suggests uh, a late winter, early spring occupation when food was more scarce. And these scatters were sealed by peat, which accumulated when this part of the valley edge and floodplain became swamp at around 9,500 BC which is probably not that long after this particular episode of occupation. But this material doesn't represent a group of people frozen in time. So what about the things that they were doing around the area in that landscape? Aspects of those tasks that we see at Three Ways Wharf that were actually going on in the wider area. Um, about the times that it was actually too boggy to be down here. Um, actually, I've got another map here. So, for instance, we've got Three Ways Wharf is here. Um, and at the time that this was sealed, uh, at the time that this was swamp, down here in Bedford Court, I think we can't see it actually, it's in the, another slide, but much further down south, um, in the Heathrow terraces, uh, there were stake holes, an excavation found stake holes and a timber post radiocarbon dated to the time that Three Ways Wharf was uh, still swamp. And we've got lots of small finds um, from the area as well. So we've got here on the right hand side an unfinished axe or adze and this comes this was found in a ballast pit on the top of the flood plain gravel down in moore park actually quite near the um, bedfont court area <coughs> with the stake holes these uh cores pyramidal core and other core uh were found in south Her Herfield, which is not far from three ways wharf <coughs> and then there's also small scatters along the coal and tributaries. So at uh, Long Lane and Rye Slip, we found small scatters here. This is the River Pin tributary heads off from the coal. And um, at Long Lane, for example, 19 pieces of worked flint, worked and burnt flint were found, including a microlith, which was found as part of this scatter, and this was made through soft hammer working and dated to the early Mesolithic. And it would have been made using bone or antler, uh, maybe a piece similar to that found at Three Ways Wharf, uh, or a piece of wood picked up locally. And this was probably an ad hoc napping event carried out by one or two people as opposed to the group of 20 who were down on Three Ways Wharf. And they were probably out in the woodland looking for food. And this is what I'm particularly interested in. So what is often considered to be background noise or movement? These small scatters and fine spots. <clears throat> Move into the Neolithic in Hillingdon, Coldy Farm, for example, another small scatter. Um, the HER records have this listed, well, they actually have it listed as a Mesolithic, Neolithic fine spot. Um, flints and scrapers and axe fragments are the description in the HER records. But they've actually moved out of a context which is meaningful. And so how do they connect with contemporary movement in the Colne Valley? 
How do these random signatures connect with very visible movements um, down here on the Heathrow Terrace? <coughs> much further south. How do they connect with the Stanwell Cursus, for instance, or Horton House? And how do these fine spots, uh, spot finds and small scatters in the north connect with the landscape elsewhere as well? Because people didn't collect in groups for all aspects of living, and group sizes would have fluctuated across time and across activities. So there's definite signatures of smaller movements outside these main places like Three Ways Wharf. Um, and they're part of the same narrative which made and remade this landscape. And it's where you start to get a sense of the changes and movement of people, how people occupied this valley and the surrounding area at different paces. So there's a lot of material for both Mesolithic and Neolithic movement in the Kong Valley. But it's piecemeal, so it's at different scales, different densities, and it's dispersed across a really wide area. Um, and the relations, re relationships between these spot finds, these small scatters, the concentrations of material, the features, they can reveal contextual details of group activities and settled places. And they can show how places came to be through individual paces of life and movements, as well as large-scale practice. So, actually I'm going to finish earlier, I think. This is a study at landscape scale, but it's with attention to microhistories in the material. So these isolated spot finds that I've showed you quite a few of on the slides, for example, they become decontextualised from, from their tasktape. And if we reposition them alongside larger assemblages, features, the environment, etc., they can become part of the human narrative again. And that's reflective of unplanned actions or different speeds, spectrums, duration in human practices and occupation. And so just to end, um, as I've been talking about positioning lesser known things with bigger stories, um, I've been working with an artist who's trying to get his career started um, and he's trying to interpret my landscape, which actually helps me as well. It's a kind of two-way process. Um, and so here's some of his preliminary sketches of people in the Coal Valley alongside Wessex Archaeology's illustration of the Horton House in the Coal Valley. <laughs> 